Check one, check one, two, three. Hey everybody, it's Michael Helms, also known as Michael the Sound Guy, and this is the Location Sound Podcast. You know, each episode we talk with location sound mixers, boom ops, and other industry pros about the various aspects of recording sound on location, whether it's for feature and independent films, TV commercials, interviews, any time where dialogue from actors is recorded. I started my career in the recording studios in New York City with some of the big artists back in the day, and later on projects for networks like HBO, Sci-Fi Channel, and the Cartoon Network. As time went by, I got out of the studio and began working in production sound. Whether you're a seasoned veteran or just starting out, thanks for joining us. My guest today is location sound recordist based in Tampa, Florida, and the creator of the Quiet Please Filming in Progress signs. Please welcome Joe Giannotti. Oh man, thank you. This is so cool. Now, Joe, we like to start off the show by asking, when you're working as a location sound mixer, what's in your audio kit? Okay, well, I'll start with my bag first. I use the K-Tech Stingray bag. I think it's the most back-conscious bag. I think that's important for all sound guys. Um, always make your, your spine your first priority. They have a great harness. They have a great bag. They distribute the weight to your hips instead of out front like some other bags. So the first thing is the K-Tech bag. Second thing is the mixer. The sound device is 633. I use the... SRB receivers, I use the SMQV transmitters, and I use Senkin CS11 mics. My boom mic is the Senkin CS3E. Um, I also have a 416, I have MKH70, and I have the Sheps MK41 that I really don't use anymore because I, I really love the CS3. Okay. And you usually have just two wireless mics and a boom? Yeah, usually two wireless and a boom, and then, um, you know, I got the extra SRB in there if it needs to be like a camera hop or two more lofts. Okay. And what about power distribution and batteries? I use some this old MP batteries uh, that I've had for probably almost uh, five years now that I probably need to replace soon. Yeah, and just like the BDS, I think like version three or four or something, just, yeah, like an ENG bag. Okay, great. And uh, regarding time code, do you have any particular time code boxes you like to use? Yeah, I use the tentacle syncs for sure, um, the older ones. I want to get the new Bluetooth ones. They seem pretty cool. Yeah, I think I, I mentioned it on a previous episode, but we were talking about how the new ones, apparently, if you actually film video on your phone, you can actually tap into that time code. And so your phone video will have the time code stamp in it. Oh, dude, that's, so if you that's super to, cool. Yeah, yeah, so if you want to do behind the scenes or something and sync up some audio... But now, yeah. don't quote me on that, but that's what, that's what I understood when I talked to the guy. So. Yeah, I just like that it's all kind of Bluetooth and you can just check up on them every now and then. Exactly. When it comes to recording location sound, what are the main projects that you usually do? A lot of ENG stuff. Um, I grew up working with my dad. He's a DP, so I'm his first call for audio, which is super cool. But yeah, his main client's ESPN, so just growing up, you know, when I was little, I would go help him out, and it would be all ESPN, either like an ENG thing at a, at a sporting event, or like one of their documentary things where we're just doing sit-down interviews. Oh, that's great. So when did you actually get started working with your dad? I always kind of went on to shoots with him when I was little, um, which was super cool. I would just, you know, pick up slack between him and the sound guy, because, you know, it was just like a ENG crew, a producer, shooter, sound guy. And then whoever you're interviewing or whatever's going on, a reporter. And uh, yeah, I started full time with him right out of high school. Was there a first memory that you remember having of being on set? Actually, yeah. Um, just hanging around at like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers facility, uh, throwing the football with like Warren Sapp, not knowing who that ever was and stuff like that. Um, running tapes to John Madden's trailer and stuff like that, because that's where the producer was logging stuff. And just like all that kind of stuff, ESPN was like a big family back then, and it wasn't weird if you, if you brought your, your son or daughter to set to kind of help out and run tape and stuff like that. Oh, that's great. So far, what has been the most interesting project you've worked on? I guess the, the coolest thing I ever worked on that I had a lot of fun with, and it was more just the experience around the shoot, was um, a documentary for Smithsonian Channel about three years ago called Hunting the Hammerhead, and I just got to go to the Bahamas with 
a couple of really cool guys and just shared this like basically a townhouse and we all just worked out of there and every day we got out on the boat I was top side you know just booming whoever came up out of the water with new information with these shark researchers yeah we just had a really cool time I got to snorkel with hammerhead sharks in Bahamas and uh, the whole trip there was just you know a lot of fun it was a good time just seeing the Bahamas and getting to work and stuff like that and working for uh, the Smithsonian Channel well that's pretty cool now, yeah. did you do any kind of like uh, hydrophones or anything like that, recording underwater sounds? Yeah, I don't think it was, it was something they, they really totally needed, but we had one and we used one and I just had it down there recording when, whenever, I, whenever they were down there. Okay. What was your worst on-set experience? I don't, they all just kind of go back to just feeling guilty about letting like clothing noise through, I guess, um, in certain situations. I know... Larry was on here. He was talking about um, the first time he tried to hide a mic in a tie. He put it behind the tie. And I, I listened to that one and I was like, dude, uh, I did the same thing my first time. It was like Tom Rinaldi and like Derek Jeter or something. And it was like, you know, they give you 15 minutes with these athletes and you just got to throw the mic on. And it was right after I graduated high school, I first started working with my dad. And, you know, he was letting me get on the easier interview shoots and stuff like that. And I was, you know, micing him up. I just put it right behind his tie because... I didn't know about the tie knot thing and stuff like that. And they didn't want to see it. So I was like, fine. It ended up sounding fine on, on TV when I, when I watched it. But in my headphones, I was like just cringing the whole time. Yeah, I think we've all done that. I think we all we stuck the mic right behind there and it, <sighs> it sounded muffled. And, yeah. you know, and then later on, yeah, we, we learned how to, to do it differently. So especially when you're trying to hide a mic, you know, if you're just clipping it on the tie, usually for interviews and a lot of times they don't, they don't mind it showing because we expect that. But like if it's an actor and we don't want to see it, you know, then it gets a little more challenging. So, yeah, a lot of producers are kind of opening up now and they're being pretty cool with, with interviews. You know, if it's showing and it looks neat and, and nice, they're, they're okay with it. Um, there was kind of like a period there where everyone was like, hide it, hide it, hide it, even for just like a basic interview, you know, sometimes it's okay to see it. I don't know. <laughs> I agree. I agree. What has been your biggest technical challenge on set? The technical stuff that I do is all pretty simple. You know, I, I rarely have more than like five people on, on microphones at once. So RF is pretty easy. Jamming cameras is fine. I guess I think the, the biggest part of my job is just like the clothing noise thing. I mean, every, I, I'm starting to do like more commercial stuff now. So hiding mics obviously is number one so yeah just eliminating clothing noise man just getting the clean clean sound right right in here okay so you know we always like to try to be prepared for an audio gig but have you ever forgotten something thankfully i, I really have never forgotten anything um there's one been one time uh moving from location to location you know, I kind of left like a breakaway cable behind just because we were hardwiring all in the interview and then we had to go do this total other thing. We just kind of like, you know, unplugged and had another setup, but it, it was, it was fine. You know, just used a couple XLRs to go into a camera and just made sure it was sounding good. The, the camera guy listened and stuff like that. So yeah, nothing, nothing crazy. Yeah. That's good. Good. Cause thankfully, yeah. <laughs> A few of us have some horror stories about things that we forgot, and we're like, uh, how are we going to do our job? <laughs> no, here in Florida, it's mainly just you forget your raincoat or you forget your rain gear, and that's when things really get real, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, just working on, like, dock stuff out here or whatever. Um, if it rains, like the past three days, I was shooting video on this racetrack, and, and it, was, it was getting rainy, and we just had to go get get all the footage and I had to cover up. I have my like little Orca rain cover and I had my rain jacket and I put the safety tape over my connectors and okay, I didn't do the condom on the mic cause it wasn't that bad, but uh, it, was, yeah. it was all good. That's, that's cool. Yeah. I, you, do you like your Orca rain cover? Yeah, it's, it's easy and it's light and I can clip it just with like a little carabiner onto my bag and, and just kind of run with it in case it does start to drizzle. Cause you know, Florida's wild, man. It's just, It'll rain for 30 minutes downpour, it'll stop, and, and you might not be able to get back to go grab something in, in between all those little bouts of rain. So you just have to clip it on and find something that's easy to take with you. So uh, what expendables do you like to use? My expendables are, are pretty simple. Um, I use the uh, Rycote Stickies with RM11 sometimes now is my new thing, or just with, I bought a big sheet of that Bubble Bee piece of fur. Mm -hmm. And um, 
if I really don't know what I'm going into, I'll just rig all my mics with a uh, sticky with, with the bubble bee over it. And I can usually find a pretty safe place to put that and just like a really unpredictable run and gun situation if it needs to be hidden. But honestly, my go-to is just a, a vampire clip, man. Just, mm-hmm. they're, they're great. Yeah, actually, I was working with a client recently and, uh, you know, I always try to tell them, hey, I'm, I'm pinning this vampire clip here. So, you know, don't reach up and grab it because you might poke your finger. And I didn't say anything. I was just clipping it on there. And she grabbed her shirt and yanked it and did and stuck herself. And I was like, oh, I am oh. so sorry. I know. I always try to like, it's weird. Yeah, I try to say like before, whenever there's a vampire clip involved, like while I'm miking them, just when it's time to take the mic off, I'll come get it. There's some sharp pins on here. I, I would hate for you to poke yourself and they'll forget for sure. Yeah, <laughs> it, exactly. It happens. Yeah. So uh, regarding backups, uh, how long do you keep them? I'll keep a backup just probably for a couple months. Um, with my new MacBook, I'm using like the iCloud drive to kind of back stuff up. So there's not, there's not a ton of space on my computer, you know, especially with that. So a couple months is usually fine. Um, I have had to save the day sometimes, you know, a couple weeks later and stuff like that. But there's never been a situation where someone's called me and, and has said, I need the audio and I haven't had it. So I think a couple months is a good period. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. We've all had, I think we all have a story where we've had the backup and they needed it. So kind of feels good, right? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Now regarding backups, um, do you back it up before you give it to the client? Well, no, because usually I'll transfer there on set and then when I get home, I'll back it up. So, and it's always cool to do that, back it up. And then part of that process is just listening back to stuff with, with headphones and thinking what you could do better maybe next time and stuff like that. I, I spend a lot of time doing that. Okay. When you're recording, do you do a lot of your clients, do they prefer to go direct to camera or do you just record just to your kit? So yeah, most of the time, most of the work I do, everyone's fine going direct to camera. Um, that's how I grew up working, doing ENG news stuff. It's always direct to camera. They're not going to use anything. If you record it anyway, they're not going to use it. They're going to rec- they're going to use whatever's in the camera. So I always kind of treat everything like that as whatever I'm sending to the camera has to be, you know, usable and, and good. But I I pretty much everyone kind of expects you to record now. So that's just you know built in. You know, you're going to record even if they don't ask. I'm going to do it for my own safety and my own backup. If I have to, if something happens and I have to send it for whatever reason. But yeah, most of the time I'm, I'm sending direct to the camera hops for reality stuff, hops for some doc stuff. And even whether or not they ask, I'm going to record in my mixer no matter what. Okay. Now, uh, working in the hot summer here in Florida, have you ever had any issues with your, any gear? Yeah, too actually. Uh, and this is a cool shoot too. Um, I was working at Kennedy Space Center. It was for this um, company that just... I guess they built the fastest street legal electric car and they got to use like the runway that all those space shuttles would land on when they came back. And and it was, it was really cool. So they were racing the car down this runway and we had about like a, like a 30 minute break after we set up to just kind of go back and, and grab some, some snacks or whatever we did. And I left my boom pole just out, out there and I was going to record all the sound with this, with this boom pole and man, since it was the Air Force Base, they had these planes, these fighter jets coming by, and they set up all this cool stuff. And during that 30-minute period, it was so hot out on the runway that the internal cables that connect the connector of my boom pole just, like, melted away wow. on while they were sitting around on the runway. And I, I, I went back out there, and, and there was no sound, and I kind of looked in there, and all these – there was, like, two or three little – you know, really thin um, cable wires still kind of connected, but dude, they like melted away. It was so hot. It was wow. like nothing I'd seen before. So, you know, I just took an XLR and, and just went direct to the mic and everything was fine. But yeah, with the heat, you'd never expect it to be that bad. But when you're on a blacktop runway at Kennedy Space Center and the sun's beating down and, and it's, it's <laughs> it melted those cables, dude. Wow. Yeah. I've yeah. never heard anybody melting cables before. So that that's crazy. <sighs> Yeah, I, I didn't either. And when I tell people still, they're just like, that's insane. And maybe it was built up over time of me just being in the sun or leaving it out in the sun. And, and I had been using that boom pole for a while, but I mean, it, it, they melted, man. <laughs> man, that's, yeah, that's crazy. 
For people getting started, from your experience, would you recommend them renting gear or buying gear? Well, I guess it depends if you have any other way to make money, um, because I, we know that if we're renting gear, we're not making as much money. But um, buy it if you can, even if it's like a set of G3s instead of some electrosonics, just just do it. Yeah, definitely buy it if you can, because you're going to make way more money. Just only work with your gear, just if you can. Yeah, plus, too, you know, when, when it's your gear, you really have time to, to get, you know, get into it and and experiment and try things if you just show up i know sometimes people provide gear for us and but you know you just don't know is everything working correctly is there a problem with a particular cable or jack or something and so when it's yours you know and i've had that experience and i kind of just cut off that you know from the start you know the the first time I ever worked with anyone else's gear, I'll, I'll say it, it was VER and they sent like a, a Sure FP32 or FP33 and it was, it was just crap, man. And, and, and I went through about two of those because they were broken. They just had to keep sending other ones. And, and I know it's not always that bad, but you know, there's been times where I know that if you show up to a, a reality set or something, they want you to work with their gear. They'll just throw you a Pelican case full of spaghetti cables and they say, okay, build your, build your bag right when you get on set. And you're basically working more and making less if you do that. And I think if you can just really know your bag and, and just, you know that you can just turn it on and know that it's working, that's, you go into a shoot with a, a whole nother comfort level, man. That's true. What are some common rookie mistakes that sound people make? The main mistake that I see from just anyone in any position on set, any role, is just not being self-aware. I mean, sound, if you think about it, it's easy. You want, a, you want a clean signal coming in and you want a clean signal going out. And um, most of the people that I see that have a hard time on set are, it's just because of their set etiquette and the way they carry themselves. And um, I do tell a lot of new people that I work with that people are gonna prefer to work with you if you know a little bit less and you're just, you're cool and you're good to work with, and you're dependable and you show up on time and you're just, you're self-aware. I think just being self-aware is like the number one thing. Um, some people aren't self-aware. They'll say the wrong thing to the wrong person. And it's just, you don't want to create like a bad vibe on set. Good tip for sure. <laughs> we always want to be prepared on set. Do you do any particular things that just to make sure you've got extra of what you need? Yeah, I think I have redundancy in almost everything except a mixer. I mean, we can, I guess I have a, uh, a Zoom F4 that my pops bought, you know, a while ago for just a second recorder that I have that he let me use, thankfully. So, you know, if anything goes down with my mixer, I can just throw that in and it's a Zoom F4. Sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what's, your, what's been your experience with the Zoom? Um, I, I've only used it for one thing. It just had to be just in this control room, just picking up sound and time code from this like multi-camera show that we were doing that it was literally only for the transcribers. So I was recording MP3s with time code and sent it out. So it's, it was good for that. Maybe a little overkill. I probably could have done that with like, a the little H4N or whatever. For those of our listeners that are just getting started as well, do you have any freelance tips for them? Yeah, actually, I found Instagram to be like the best tool for keeping in touch with people you work with. My tip would be get on social media as, as much as possible. Just try to be working when you're not working, if that makes sense. And, you know, finding people that are in your area, like production companies, and just following them and keeping in touch with them. And just like, just really trying to create online relationships because a lot of relationships are built online. I've gotten work from Instagram. I've gotten work from LinkedIn. I've gotten work from people that have seen my Facebook page and have messaged me. So just be out there and just be just trying to build relationships online. If you do work with a bunch of people that you have stuff in common with on set, uh, just, you know, make friends with them. Just, just, just be cool. Yeah. Um, those relationships totally go a long way. Excellent. Do you use any of the online freelance services? Production Hub, for sure, yeah. If you're a freelancer, sign up for Production Hub. Call Tom Greeley uh, at Production Hub. Give him, like, whatever it costs, 400 bucks for the year. One gig will pay that off immediately. So get on all the directories. I mean, you can't 
you can't do enough. There's so much online. There's Mandy.com, Production Hub. You know, even if you don't get anything, just just you have to be persistent and be on there. Be on LinkedIn. Just just build yourself out online because when you're not working, you got to be working. Now, when you're working with, say, a company that's from out of town, do you try to get 50% up front? Never had a problem with that ever. I've never had an issue or I've not been paid. I've never had an issue. You just have to really have a good BS detector and know when, when something's not right. And then you can start to get into that. But most of the people I do work with are from out of town. They're coming down to Florida for, you know, just a single day of an interview with, we have a lot of retired athletes that live in Florida. So there's a lot of sports doc documentaries being shot here. So people, you know, come down for one day, one interview, you just kind of have to trust people and then see what happens from there. I know a lot of people have deal memos and they'd probably yell at me right now and stuff like that. But man, I, I just do, I'm, do a lot of ENG type stuff and, and it's just, you send your invoice, you get your check and I've never had an issue. So I, I haven't been doing it that long, but we'll see. I'm sure eventually I'll get stiffed. <laughs> yeah, you've been, no, that's great. That's a great, because you know, a lot of people, I hear, I talk with people all the time that got burned. And so, you know, it happens once or twice and then they, they try to, especially with a company that they're not familiar with and you know, mm -hmm. just up front say, hey, you know, since we haven't worked together before, you know, and they uh, usually get a, you know, some sort of down payment, which helps out just in case the, the client bails. Yeah, that would be cool. I mean, I would totally even be up for doing that myself. <laughs> yeah. But um, I don't know. I just kind of just sense, sense a certain amount of trust with certain people. And if things aren't really going the way they they're supposed to. I usually don't get to shoot anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Tell me a little bit about your quiet, please filming in progress. Tell me about that sign. Wow. So, okay. It started off as a joke with me and my dad. I told you earlier, my dad's a DP. I grew up working with him. And there was one day we were working in some like hotel conference room. It wasn't even the people that were there for the conference. There was just like a couple really uh, chatty makeup ladies outside the door. I said, how funny would it be, man, if we made a big pop-out reflector that said, you know, quiet, please, filming in progress on one side. And then on the other side, if they were still allowed, we can go in and open the door and turn that sign around and it'll say, please shut the you know what up. So we really joked about that and it just happened to be on April Fool's that we were joking about that. So, you know, we were on the road, so I got back to my hotel room with nothing to do. So I made this fake mock-up post, like, coming soon, this new product. And it was that sign, and it said, the quiet, please, and then it said the, the vulgar side. And it was just a joke, and I put it up on my Instagram, and I said, oh, I'm making these signs that say, shut the F up. That was probably, like, the most popular Instagram post I had, like, when, when, that, when I did that. I was like, okay, there's got to be something here. So I was like, I'll just make the nice ones. It's hard to print on those things. So I, I worked with the guy that I'm printing with and we messed up like 20 or 30 of them before we actually got like the ink right to where when you would close it and open it back up, like it's not going to be peeling every time off of this sign. I mean, when you think about it, that's, you really got to um, print that correctly for it to stay on there and to be a good, to be a good sign. But yeah, that's how it started. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, and now I've sold a few hundred and, and it's, it's so cool, man. People take pictures with them and they send me them and I share them. And it's just, it's like, it's like a whole community started just out of those signs, you know? <laughs> and they're, they're available all over the world now, right? Yeah, all over the world. Someone just sent me a picture of Italy, some sound shop. Uh, and I must... You know, I might need to make them in Italian, but uh, they're in a sound shop in Italy somewhere. But yeah, I have international shipping on my website, so I've shipped them all over the world. And I think there's three sound shops that have them right now. Wilcox Sound, TAI Audio here in Orlando, and Gotham Sound. Okay. Are yeah. they available on Amazon as well? No, I haven't done the Amazon yet. I've been having an issue just being a little backordered every now and then, to, to tell you the truth. Um, they're, they're getting pretty popular and it's hard to keep up with it. So I think I'm going to really try to pursue B&H next once I can really get a good stock of them. And, and I know that if B&H needs like a handful or whatever, I, I could do that. No problem. Yeah. Now you need to do a Spanish version, an Italian version, and, you know, like a, a Chinese version or something <laughs> like that. That'd be great. I know. I might need some people to help me with that. So I don't uh, just go Google translator on it and say something that I shouldn't be saying. Right. Right. Well, that's cool. 
you know, if some of our listeners wanted to get into location sound recording, what would you recommend they do? It's weird because I just grew up with my dad and he was the camera guy and, and I basically, he gave me the opportunity straight out of high school, do you want to work with me? And I was at Buffalo Wild Wings and I just said, yeah, sure. So um, one thing I have been thinking about is, is if you do want to start, uh, I think news and ENG stuff is a really cool place to start, like I started, because every, th- every time you work, there's going to be other media there and it's going to be a big like networking event basically like if you talk to the other sound guys and you talk to the other people that are there you can really make a lot of friends like just at work that do what you do and and i guess that could go a long way but um a lot of people want to work in like movies and stuff but if they just want to just get started and, and learn man news is no better way i think you can you have to get it right you know they're going to use that audio from camera they're not going to do any really any post editing on it and it's it's the best way i think that i learned to just get it right and and you have to work fast like now i'll I'll go to a shoot and and the people are like man that was really quick or something or like someone will ask like you know can you mic the talent 10 minutes after i already mic'd everyone and stuff like that and they're like wow but i learned that in in news you just have to be quick and you have to get it right and you have to just be proficient and i I guess if there's any advice, if you have the opportunity, meet some local like news guys that do news stuff that still use sound guys. I know that's hard to find. A lot of news guys don't even use sound guys anymore, but I guess that's, that's, that's some of the advice, but just be cool, man. Just, um, be nice to everyone when you're working. Like I said, make the internet profiles, get on Instagram, get on LinkedIn, just try to show as many pictures as you can of what you do, because as a sound guy, it's like, we're not, we don't have a sound reel. We could take the best sound we've ever recorded. We sure. But that doesn't mean that it it wasn't recorded in like the, the worst or the most perfect environment. So like sound reel isn't worth anything. It's, it's kind of a joke whenever someone kind of asks for one every now and then, but we take pictures whenever you're on set. And if you're working and just let people know that I'm out here, I'm busy, I'm getting the job done. And just, I think if you're just starting out, just meeting as many people as you possibly can networking, I guess. Yeah, no, great advice. Great advice. So, uh, well, Joe, as we start to kind of wrap things up, do you have any final words of wisdom to share for location sound people around the world? Okay. I guess my advice for everyone would be, be cool, be kind, be good to work with on set because there's so many times where people have told me, you're like a normal sound guy. Like you're like a normal person. And like, I'm like, what is that? Is that even a compliment? Because apparently we get a bad rap for being, being weird or introverted. And I know we work in our own little bubble, but it's, it just goes such a long way to be the person that someone is going to want to go have a beer with or something. And it just be nice to people. If you don't know the most, that's okay. Um, be upfront about it and, and just, be a hard worker and just just show that you're 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 willing to learn. That's that's more important than someone that's going to come up on set just thinking they know everything or egos and stuff like that. Just leave all that at the door and and just you know you're in their world for that day or that that week or whatever. Uh, just be pleasant to be around, and I guarantee you they'll have you back. Excellent. So, uh, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? So, I think the best way that I keep in touch with people is through Instagram. Uh, like I said, every, everyone I work with, I try to follow and keep in touch with. My Instagram is Florida Sound Man. Uh, my website's floridasoundman.com. My email address is joe at floridasoundman.com. And find me on Instagram. I'll, I'll follow you back and, and keep in touch with you if, if we're into the same stuff. And we'll keep in touch, man. I'm, I'm here to make friends with everyone and, and just be in this business for life. If I could do sound the rest of my life, I'll be happy, man. That's great. That's great. So uh, I want to say thanks to Joe Giannotti today. And if you're doing some production work in Tampa, Florida, please look him up. Well, thank you, man. And a big thanks to all of our listeners out there. If you'd like us to discuss a particular topic, please send us an email at locationsoundpodcast at gmail.com. We would love for you to subscribe and leave us a comment. We're available on Apple Podcasts and iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, and on your favorite podcast app. Until next time, remember, sound is half the picture.